Thank you so much, everyone. The keynote is next with uh, John Ruffalo and uh, Anne Gaviola, the senior broadcast journalist at Global News who will be interviewing him. There are a lot of people in this room, a lot of people uh, in this industry, a lot of people in this country, but it's hard to imagine that anyone has had the pandemic that John Ruffalo has. Legendary achievement over decades, then new company, new beginnings, controversy at places he helped build like 111, then seemingly out of nowhere, devastating tragedy, followed by incredible, seemingly superhuman progress. So what's next? Let's hear from the man himself. John is the founder and managing partner of Mavericks Private Equity, an equity firm focused on technology-driven growth and disruption investment strategies. As a firm run by entrepreneurs, founded by entrepreneurs, and for entrepreneurs, Mavericks is investing out of an inaugural fund of half a billion dollars in the areas of health and wellness, financial services, transportation and logistics, live work, play and learn, and retail. John chairs the investment committee, guides the strategy of the firm, and is deeply involved with sourcing and leading investment opportunities, particularly within the technology industry. He's also the founder of Omer's Ventures and co-founder and vice chair of the Council of Canadian Innovators. Over the course of his leadership as the CEO of Omer's Ventures, they invested over half a billion dollars US in over 40 disruptive technology companies, some of them household names across North America, including companies like Shopify, Xanadu, Wattpad, Wave, Hootsuite, Rover, Desire to Learn, Hopper, DuckDuckGo, Touch Bistro, and League. What a legacy. During his time at o tenure at Omer's, John also formed Omer's Platform Investments, and as its executive managing partner, he led investments in Purpose Financial, Point North Capital, District Ventures, 111, and Arcturn Ventures. John co-founded the Council of Canadian in Innovators with Jim Balsillie. It's a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping high-growth technology firms get to scale. He'll be speaking with, as I said, Ann Gaviola, senior broadcast journalist at Global News. Come on in, John. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Well, this is, wow. is kind of lovely, isn't it? Wow. That's, thank you so much. That was, uh, that was uh, unexpected, <laughs> but uh, I appreciate it. Uh, so my plan for today is I'm going to take you on a kind of broad-ranging conversation. There are a lot of topics I want to get into with you, and my goal here is for everyone in the audience, in person and, and watching uh, from other parts of the world, to take away some real insight, some pearls of wisdom from our conversation. Uh, but I do want to start off with the fact that uh, this is kind of your first big uh, event of this scale in person yes. since your catastrophic accident uh, back in 2020. And I want to take a moment before we dig into everything to just kind of acknowledge it is a, a bit of a miracle that you and I are, are sitting here having this conversation in this capacity. Yes, yes. H how are you, John? How are you really these days? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, you know, just like you said, uh, uh, I didn't really know how close to death I was uh, because you don't know you're in a coma. And, uh, you know, having my wife just wait for me to die, which it's pretty, uh, pretty difficult. And when you get to the other side uh, and then everyone tells you, I can't believe you're alive, you're t you know, your reaction is, what, what the hell are you talking about? Because you, you know you were you were you were dying, and I was like, no, I di I didn't know, uh, but now I actually know how death sort of feels like, and you know the the only thing I can really say is being alive uh, is the first step to uh, to having progress, and you know if you, when you're asking me the question how am I right now is they did tell me uh, once. Um, I, I, I did get through the multiple surgeries. Um, the, the head of Sunnybrook did say that that was about a, a one in a million chance. But then once they told you that, 
uh, they also said, well, you're never, ever going to walk again. And, uh, you know, the reaction there is like, like, Jesus, can you punch me in the face again after that accident? And, you know, my honest reaction when they left was, fuck you. Like, don't tell me I'm not going to walk. But honestly, in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, my God. And all I can just say to you is they didn't predict that or that. And I am cycling again and walking now. And I, I have a walker. And they just didn't know that that was even possible. So, you know, next time I come here next year, I should be walking with two poles again and, and out of the wheelchair. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm just digesting that, and I, I think um, I, I feel very blessed to, to be able to have this conversation with you. And also, I, I don't know, what do you say to someone? Congratulations. I'm, I'm so <laughs> well, glad you didn't die. Uh, all the rest I of it. I'm a, I, I am happy to be here in front of you. How is that? <laughs> I'm Wonderful. happy to be in front of anybody at this point. <laughs> Um, and you know, so this, this kind of, I'm going to call it a transformation or a journey that you went through. I don't think it's a stretch to say that most of us through this pandemic um, have, have done a lot of kind of reflecting on, on how we want to live life, uh, you know, things that we might change going forward. And in terms of transformation, I think what's happened in the tech industry has been kind of once in a lifetime. Uh, the acceleration of a lot of trends that maybe would have taken, you know, five, ten years yes. to, to play out. So let's talk about the big pink elephant in the room first and foremost. What has happened with the tech sector because of this once-in-a-lifetime pandemic? Yeah, so, so I, I would say, and I'm going to take you back a, a little bit. To me, the transformative time, I, I've been in technology for over 30 years, so I've seen virtually every cycle. And... Uh, I think that we are on the continuum of the greatest transformation since the Industrial Revolution. But don't let this blip uh, distract you. If you separate uh, uh, what happened is separate good businesses versus uh, excess amount of capital increasing valuations. That bubble burst. It should have burst. It was a ridiculous bubble. And what the pandemic did, it did two things, and you touched on it. The pandemic, much to my surprise, accelerated that bubble. And the quantum of capital coming in and funding uh, a smaller number of companies just shot up valuations. And she say, so, so big deal. Well, the problem is, is that as an entrepreneur, you need to accept those high valuations. It was the investors who lost their minds completely. And there's nothing short of complete and utter stupidity by investors uh, just chasing, and they had this fear of missing out. But as an entrepreneur, you know, you have to take it. Problem is, if you need another round of financing, and many of them do, there's now going to be this down round, or there's implications to your employees who might have stock options. These are all fixable. So don't worry about this stuff. We went through this in the dot-com bust, and, a, and the greatest companies emerged out of that. So, so don't worry about it. The part to worry about is... Uh, if you look before the pandemic, technology was replacing every industry, or at least the enablement of technology was being embedded. And I believe the pandemic changed nothing. It accelerated things, just what you just said, at such a rate that it was an unsustainable rate. And when, the, when this bubble has burst here, What's happened is things are not retreating like they were five or 10 years ago. They're still continuing, like say e-commerce. E-commerce will continue to grow at low double digits for the next five, 10 years, no question in my mind. But it, it popped 100%. Well, that was ridiculous. That was not 
that was not the plane. So from a business perspective, if you grew your business and grew your costs, thinking that you're on a new growth plane, well, that's going to be a problem. And now you're going to have to readjust your organization from a cost perspective. The part now that I worry about is the oncoming recession. And I'd say the odds of a recession happening are high. I actually think we're in the technical recession right now. And I think that for the next 18 months, it's going to be somewhat difficult. But the stronger companies will get through this. They're going to be stronger than they ever were before. The weak ones will go away. You'll be able to grab the talent. So in the funniest way, I was hoping for this to cleanse the mess and to get the strongest companies through to the other side. So I hear what you're saying about, you know, the strong will survive. There may be some consolidation and then yes. we'll come out of it, this cleanse. Though we can all acknowledge that, you know, when bubbles burst, when we go through a cleansing, there are... Uh, there is collateral damage, and it, it can be quite painful. Yes, it is, yes. Yeah. Um, before I continue on, though, you mentioned the R word, which seems to be popping up a fair bit in my conversations. And regardless of whether you're in the camp of we're heading for some sort of economic slowdown or a full-on recession, you know, two quarters of, of contraction, uh, the thinking is this is something that we should prepare for, certainly here in Canada and in the second quarter of this year. Uh, what are your views on you know, how to best prepare and what kind of recession we could be facing? Yes, so, so uh, th th this was fully anticipated that, at least from my perspective, and if those of you may have followed some of my writings, particularly in the past year, uh, there was two things that were going to happen. One was, so, and, and, and we have, since 2009, the U.S. Fed essentially printing money. And the way they print money is through the bond, their bond-buying program. And they artificially had this low interest rate environment that was artificial. We ex expected that with at least a 200 basis point increase, the pin was going to burst. Now, at the same time that this was happening, you need to pay attention to macroeconomic events. And this is going to be perhaps the most significant impact to South America. The United States, after 1989, had to make a decision on now that uh, the capitalists beat the communists and, and Russia fell, the entire Cold War machine of the United States was starting to say, what are we doing patrolling all of these waters, and particularly from U.S. naval presence? And, and they didn't do anything for a long time. And starting really with Obama, the U.S. finally said, it's time for us to retreat. And the whole Bretton Woods arrangement that occurred in the post-World War II was going to fall apart. And what this means is the U.S. will no longer protect shipping. And why is that important? Because of the logistics and the way that North America uses China in particular to produce goods. And the United States Navy protects shipping lanes. The United States Navy started pulling out. And remember when Trump came into power, the first thing he said is, we're getting the hell out of here because no one's paying us for it. What does this really mean? Logistics and shipping costs were already going to be on the rise, number one. And it was going to rise faster than the typical cost of inflation, which would have meant that nearshoring was starting to happen. And the United States is basically using Mexico as their nearshoring operations. The pandemic, interestingly, popped that way, way faster than... I even imagine. And what's going to happen, I, this is my belief on here, is the American-Chinese tensions will continue now. Russia is, is going to be gone because this is Russia's last attempt to try to save itself. But China and the United States are going to continue to fight. The United States is going to use Mexico as the source of goods. But what's going to happen is Mexico can't handle it. 
and the inflation in Mexico is going up. It's going to go all the way down through Latin America. And for those of you who know the U.S. Monroe Doctrine, protecting North and South America, you're going to see the Na U.S. navies protect North and South America. And South America is going to become the most significant trading partners that we haven't seen. And I think this is fascinating. This is why I'm actually speaking here, because I'm starting to pay way, way more attention to what's going on in Latin America, because I think this is a great opportunity. The demographics are right, but most importantly, the world is going to be a really messy place, really bad, I think. Europe is going to be a shitstorm. But if you're in North and South America, only because of the United States Navy, it's going to be protected. So you're talking about some pretty major seismic shifts. Uh, I, I think that's fascinating, though I do want to bring it back to uh, the tech conversation yes. that we were having. And I want to get back to valuations and, and kind of the state of where we're at now. It, it doesn't feel like the kind of corrections are, are quite done. Correct. Yes. So um, what, what I believed, and you're still seeing, and it's not quite there, is we were going to revert back to the long-term mean for valuation. So let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. Software company, so a SaaS software company. The long-term, and you, let's just use revenues as a, as a proxy for value because really you shouldn't just use a multiple, but let's just use it. The, the, the mean was between three to seven times forward revenue with the outlier. The outlier growing at 100% plus per year, achieving as high as 10. That is the long-term mean. When I funded Shopify, I, I gave them a 10 times forward multiple back in 2013, and I was having a heart attack when I did that. It was the highest valuation. Uh, a year ago, or actually not even a year ago, six months ago, the average valuation, the average was 20 times forward. Wow. And our team, the record in the team, uh, in, in the opportunities that we saw was 100 times forward. You have to be the dumbest investor in the world to give that. Why? In the example that, and it was funded, and you guys know who the funders are. It's a well-known large funder. The revenues had to go from $5 million to I think it was $2.5 billion. I can't remember. $2.5 in five years, assuming the same uh, model and the company in question hasn't even hit 10 million and one year has gone by. It just it was insanity. So we're going to go back to it. Here is the, 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 the problem. We're not there yet. And uh, the average drop needed to be about 67% or thereabouts, on average when you blend it across. There's been, a, there's been at least a 50% drop. And depending on the company, there is still room to go down for sure. So it's going to get worse before it gets better. Worse before it gets better. I've, I've heard that one before. Um, the, the final piece in this kind of the state of where you know, tech is, um, I want to have a bit of a philosophical conversation about this term tech. I think once upon a time it used to mean, you know, gadgets that you would purchase yes. as a consumer, and now it's evolved to, it's, it's everything that exists to make yes. our lives possible. Yes. Um, so I think it's kind of a funny term, but uh, what is the state of, of technology? Are you still kind of a, a wild optimist, a cautious realist? How, oh, yeah. how would you describe yourself? So this is, this is uh, you're hitting the thesis of why people ask me, why did I move from focusing on a venture investor and going to growth private equity. It's, it is what you just described. So uh, for most of my career, I was an investor or an advisor or involved in tech as, as described as an industry. And when you describe it as an industry as compared to financial services, healthcare, et cetera, it really meant classically Software companies, 
hardware companies, semiconductor were the three biggest segments. That to me is classic tech. Sure. And, and which represents, I don't know, 10% of our GDP. But in 2015, I had my big aha moment. It was the first time that I actually saw tech move from an industry to a horizontal, crossing every industry. And the first one at the time in 2015 was financial services, where I would meet regularly with the CEOs of Canada's biggest banks, and they were frustrating me. And then around 2015, they all said, you know what, we better uh, enable our financial services businesses through technology because we're starting to see too many folks starting to chip away at us. And, and I really saw for the first time that the application or enablement of tech crossed the chasm. Now, what really happened? And, and then we called it health tech, prop tech, whatever tech. And tech the rest, yeah. Every business is gonna require tech because you know what you call a business that doesn't do that? Out of business. And, and but here is the difference. And this is where I decided, uh oh, I see where the market has moved. The, those fintechs, prop techs, et cetera, who were the founders of those? And for the most part, it was the same tech people that were building the software companies. And they started to say, hey, wait a minute, I could disrupt those old healthcare folks and look at this cool tech stack that I built and this great you know, customer interface, only one problem. They didn't have a clue on, about healthcare. And, and where did you see that? As the business started to scale, you started to see the cracks. And I avoided most of those businesses. Then I started to see the non-tech entrepreneur who was, you know, the healthcare expert for 20 years going, uh-oh, I better insert tech into my businesses and use that to defend against either upstarts or to challenge the incumbents. And the funny thing that I noticed was that capital wasn't chasing them. Huh. And that's when I made the jump and started chasing those folks. So they're non-tech entrepreneurs who are tech enlightened. And the point is, uh, and Mark Andreessen said it best, you know, software eating the world. Technology is eating the world. And if you're not in technology, you will not be in business. So it is massive long-term optimism for everybody involved in technology, but there's going to be these speed bumps along the way. Okay, let's, let's switch gears to a section that I kind of like to call your, your lens and your experience applied to some things that people are, are talking about, wondering about a lot these days. And uh, top of mind for a lot of people is, is what's been described as a kind of bloodbath uh, collapse in the crypto markets. Crypto, yes. And um, I mean, from your vantage point, you've been on the, the board of, of Ether Capital now yeah. for, I believe, six years. Yeah. And um, you know a thing or two about what's going on there. And, and full disclosure, I, I worked in fintech at a blockchain company back in 2018. Um, so I do have a little bit of insight into how fast moving and also how uh, exciting and sometimes d kind of disorganized uh, that industry can be. Yes. Uh, what's your take on what's happening in, in the crypto world? Because it's, it's seismic, it's, uh, and it, it feels like um, you know, things have already happened, but there are kind of the other shoe is, is still to drop. Yeah, no, I mean, th th this is a very complicated question, but let me overly summarize. Um, you know, it's time for the fire hose to clean out all the shit that's been going on. And that's what's happening right now. Back to that cleanse yeah. analogy. Yep. There was so many bad actors in there that I just couldn't believe that they were getting away with what they were doing. And it was, it was appalling. Um, but uh, the underlying utility, particularly of the blockchain, I think is spectacular. It's still there. You know, everyone knows, and, 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 and it's going through the exact same stages as the internet. So it goes through three stages. 
it goes through, and, and you're too young to remember this, but... Uh, Try me. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so back in the mid-1990s, if you look to see what happened, how, did the, how was the internet born? And it started with the infrastructure layer. So what was the infrastructure layer? All of the hot companies, Nortel, Lucent, uh, a company called JDS Uniphase, you wouldn't know, they were all putting the pipes down and they were all putting, uh, you know, uh, building the highway for people to traverse on. And then it collapsed horribly, as everyone knows, which ultimately led to the demise of, of Nortel. But what happened was it's all built, everybody's chasing it, throwing lots of capital, lots of bad actors in there. It's all cleaned up eventually, um, but lots of carnage happens. The next stage is the operating layer, okay? So what happened is you built the highway, how the heck do you get onto the highway? Well, you create toll roads. What was the next hottest thing? The ISPs, right? Uh, AOL and all of these started coming in and we paid for access, even though we weren't really doing much. But what was the killer layer? And this happened really after the entire crash was the application layer up top. That's when Google, uh, that's when eBay, Facebook, all of them were either born or grown through that. The same thing is happening in crypto. The infrastructure layer is still not fully built. And the complaints, for example, is processing speeds, or people have to use clumsy wallets, and uh, you know, everyone's stealing crypto here. Like, there's still- For the exchange, so, the on-off ramps. Right, and now, yeah, right. And so we went on the on-off ramps, is the exchanges. And so we didn't even fix the infrastructure layer, and already we were at the operating layer, and then a bunch of folks are trying to do the application layer. Well, the applications are not working because all this other stuff down here is not fixed. So of course the application layer is gonna fall apart. So what I think is gonna happen, we cleanse out all of the crap, get all the crooks out. Regulation is gonna come in, I think, from the currency perspective, and so it shall, because trust is gone. Um, but then the building will finally get to where it needs to be. But I still think that even when I started making investments as early as 2016, I knew I was making them early. And I believe it's part of the next technology cycle. And I think that it's still you know, totally here to stay. But my God, are people gonna take uh, a licking on this? And me personally, if I still hold Bitcoin and Ether only. I didn't do any of the other coins, and if you do, a lot of that is where all the carnage is gonna be. I, I do think Bitcoin and Ether are going to hold, but it's gonna keep on coming down, and there's gonna be big volatility uh, if you're just using it from a currency speculation perspective. So it sounds like you're in the camp of, uh, you know, cryptocurrency as a current, should be regulated as a currency as opposed to, say, a, a commodity? Well, I want to get into the security. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's two, there's two elements of it. I don't like the currency speculation part of it, right? I mean, it's, it's, I don't invest in gold. And yes, I do have Bitcoin, uh, but, but I, I, I'm doing it more for the utility. I am a huge believer in Ether and why I'm on, you know, uh, we created Ether Capital about six years ago, knowing that this will become a technological utility. But right now, there really is no utility. And, and it's kind of funny, when I ask some very young folks, do you know that Bitcoin is a complete failure? And they're looking at me saying, what the hell are you talking about? And I said, well, why was Bitcoin created? And a lot of people don't know that it was designed for micropayments. And it was actually the media industry was the greatest example. So instead of buying an entire magazine or a newspaper, you can buy an article for three cents. Well, if you're gonna pay it for three cents, how, you know, you can't use a credit card. Is there a utility that can process it? And it failed, and I don't know if you remember, 7-Eleven and a whole bunch of chains started adopting it and then no one used it. 
and then all of a sudden it became the store of currency largely due to the 21 million Bitcoin limitation and the anti-inflationary properties of it. But what I find very funny about Bitcoin is it was supposed to shoot up in an inflationary environment as a hedge. Boy, that didn't happen. We've discovered it's very correlated to traditional financial uh, assets. Uh, that, though I think that the story will be told in the long run, but yes. yes. So yeah, there's some rethinking in terms of what it is, what it, the promise of it is, and, and, and all of that. I could go on and on on that topic yeah. with you, but I'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about social media. Yeah. Um, I have two young kids. I'm uh, very interested in you know what they do online and and you know how they do it and the rest of it. You're an early investor in, in Hootsuite, among yeah. other things. Where are we at in terms of the state of social media? Yeah, this is a this is a, and I have young kids as well too, especially a daughter and and. Uh, it drives me nuts when I see what's going on on social media. It also drove me nuts um, what you know the social media players did to entice young kids and to figure out psychologically how they could have greater stickiness. So I think the behavior of a lot of the social media players have been ab abhorrent, but I do think it plays a great role in society. And you know, one of the things that we've done. And in fact, our first investment was actually a social media player called Viral Nation. So, uh, but, but here's what I think will happen is, and again, uh, 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 the blockchain could really help on this, but it's not going to happen in time. One of the problems with social media is, so you have the d democratization of 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 conveying information but they're in they're all in walled gardens and that walled garden uh is playing traffic cop and we're discovering there's some bad humans in there that are causing trouble the problem was was the manipulation of some of the stuff that was going on particularly by facebook and and uh and people have become have mistrusted them but what's fascinating is what emerged from all of that is the rise of the influencer and how people are trusting people just like them and that today is the highest correlation of buying or uh, or making a buying decision is somebody who you trust and it doesn't have to be somebody who you know uh, it, 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 it you'd think it would be but you know, it's now become all these mini celebrities. It's your notion of what a trusted source should look and right. act like, I guess. Correct. Well, what people don't know is when somebody who's, you know, showing this great running shoe that they absolutely love, they're getting paid for that. And they're getting paid by the brand. And, you know, at, at first I was wondering, Jesus, this feels a little bit like manipulation, but the reality is, People want to know what they like, and as long as the influencer is authentic, then um, you know we've discovered then that uh, the brands are selling far greater. And if you look at you know Kylie Jenner, et cetera, you know at the absolute star of it. I think a recent example too, though, is Revlon, which has filed for bankruptcy, yes. and they didn't figure out the they influencer didn't. piece of it. They didn't Zero. understand that's the way to get people to buy your makeup. And it was funny. So our, one of our biggest customers is L'Oreal and Fenty. Well, that's what they're doing. That's, yeah. But here's the other thing I didn't know. So, so this company is based in Toronto and rising uh, ex extremely quickly. The number one market in the world is Brazil. So I don't know if anybody from Brazil here, but uh, uh, we were just actually about to do an acquisition there and they have the highest correlation of trust amongst uh, influencers, number one. Number two, what I didn't know is the number of young people that want to become an influencer and get paid. So we're creating an academy. So that is an entirely new job where before the celebrities would get all of those dollars, but now those dollars are going to influencers. So 
it's an interesting category for future growth of, uh, or of, of, of the economy. It's evolved so quickly. When I tell my kids that I'm sometimes on TV, it doesn't really impress right. them. But if you tell them that I'm on YouTube, yes. wow. Yes, yeah. or TikTok. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. They haven't discovered TikTok yet, thankfully. Oh, yeah. oh God, don't, don't show them that. <laughs> um, let's talk as well about, uh, you've got some interesting experience in both the oil and gas industry, but also clean tech. Yes. Tell me about the state of energy, I guess you could call it. Yeah, I mean, I've been uh, in this space since uh, mid-2000, and uh, I mean, particularly when you have, like, you know, and he says, so what, what happened? It was the birth of my first child. Uh, it was in 2005, and you start thinking about the future for them, and and uh, it really changes things. It really it? did, yes. And then I, uh, for those of you who wouldn't know, the the leading individual in Canada uh, as an environmentalist is a gentleman named David Suzuki, which you I think may have worked with him. Uh, I, I've been his vice chair since 2006, so many, many years. And he really influenced me. And one of the things, uh, you know, that and, and, and it's embedded in our. Um, our investment thesis is is really looking at uh, organizations, and I'll use the ESG words, but truly on the environmental side, at least not doing any damage to the environment. And it's very hard to really figure that out, but the easiest one was really on energy and really the movement afoot to eliminate uh, as much and you know, quickly as possible, carbon-based energy. You know, the interesting thing that's going to happen, uh, and I was a big believer in creating carbon taxes, et cetera, and I'll tell you, if you don't believe in a carbon tax, let me, you can see the example live. Right now with the gas prices, are you driving more or less? And the answer is, well, you're going to try to drive less. A policy to incentivize you to consume. Right. Yeah. And what's happening is that everyone's really, like, Tesla can't make enough vehicles. Uh, everyone's looking at, you know, electric uh, truck vehicles. This, this, funny enough, might be one of those sparks, just like back in 1973 on the oil embargo, uh, uh, when the, uh, the Middle East cartel increased the, the prices, and it started shifting the making of the cars like, overnight. The same thing might happen. So uh, I'm a big believer in trying to find um, uh, non-carbon based energy sources. And, and the challenge that we have as a society is finding one that has reliable base load. And the one that we sort of poo-pooed is nuclear energy. And yes, it has certain issues, but I think you're going to see nuclear energy or fission as opposed to fusion, starting to become, uh, you know, not so disliked again. You know, ever since Chernobyl happened, everybody kind of reverted back, and, and certainly when Fukushima happened. But I have a feeling people are going, hmm, maybe we just made some mistakes on how they were developed. So, so I think I'd keep an eye out on that. Okay, I am mindful of the time, but I cannot not ask you yeah. about real estate. I mean, forget hockey. This is the actual national pastime. Yeah, yeah. Talking about real estate, it gives us all the feels, um, commercial, residential. What do you think, where are we in terms of the state of real estate? And I, I know that's such a broad question, but you take it where yeah. you Yeah, well, let me just give you the commercial one because I barely made it here because I just can't get around the uh, the construction and it's summer season, so construction. it is yes, and and people are not using public transit still uh, at the right uh, level of numbers in the past. I believe that um, uh, we're going to end up, you know, it's going to be after the summer. About seventy percent of people will be physically back into work who were in offices. What first of all, you know, what drives me crazy is that you know people say oh yeah, you know, people are working remote. People forget the majority of people work in frontline positions. So we tend to be kind of arrogant as, 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 as you know, what, whatever you want to call it, white collar workers to suggest that, you know, we have the freedom yet most people don't. 
So it's about 35% varying that are the office workers. Now, I believe that 70% of them will be coming back, probably more so in a hybrid arrangement, which, you know, which, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, the genie's out of the bottle. <laughs> yes. So what does that mean? I think you have to stratify the A, B, and C buildings. And I could see it. A buildings, so the premium buildings, the be, you know, in, in each of the cities are going to be full. Like, there's demand to be in some of those, whether it's for status, quality of building, et cetera. And those, are, I think, are going to be, uh, you know, even though uh, only 70% of your employees will come back on average, you also have to remember over the last 20 years, the amount of space given to each employee has shrunk dramatically since the mid-1990s. And it's not your imagination that you feel tighter in office space. It's true. They were packing you in just like airlines were. So expanding the square footage per person, I think, is, is, a, is a welcome idea. The buildings that are B and C buildings, I think, will struggle more because th there is more small and medium-sized businesses there where they can make a choice to be more remote than perhaps the large organizations. So what does this all mean? I think that there's going to be excess inventory of commercial real estate at least the next five years. Uh, if not longer. So any buildings that are in construction right now, uh-oh, uh, they're not going to be needed. Residential housing is a little bit more complicated. Um, where there's great immigration flows, like Toronto, there's always a demand for housing. But I don't know if you saw the most recent survey, I think it was done yesterday, um, so with this approximately 200 basis point increase in mortgages, one in four Canadians might not be able to pay their mortgage. But yeah, the homeowners say that. that yes. That's certainly how they're feeling. And that was taken back in April. But oh, was it April? Before the June 1st hike. Yeah, so here was funny. So I'm having this discussion with somebody, and, and it was quite amazing to me. Um, so six months ago or so, or maybe it was even a little longer. So the average mortgage rate even you know, for a locked-in mortgage or even a variable one was about 2% rate. Right? So we wrote this thesis on private equity and started to say, look, once there's a 200 basis point increase, a whole lot of crap is going to happen. It's going to be nasty. So I'm explaining to somebody from the homeowner's side, and, and I said it's a 200 basis point increase, and carnage will happen. They looked at me and said, 200 basis points is nothing. And I said, but your mortgage is at 200 basis points. It's a doubling of your payment. And it's the velocity at which they're getting yeah. hiked. Yes, they're still at emergency levels now, but they're hiking. It's outsized hikes each time, yes. right? So it's a double. So, so all of a sudden you're paying 7,000 a month and you go to 14,000. Uh, how are you going to do that? And it's all, uh, and I remember the person just, just reacted. So this is what's going to happen, and, I, and, and I'm quite concerned. Canada was ranked as one of the most over-indebted countries in the world as it related to the value of their home. We've had that kind of title or that situation for a while, though. Yes. It's so, worked out okay so far. I don't think it's going to be, I think, that, so the, the prices are, like, they've stopped dead in its tracks. I think they're going down. Uh, I'm watching the United States, uh, places like Florida. I would say not only has it stopped, it started to decrease by about 10%. I don't think it's going to be a horrible crash like it was back in 1990 where things were dropping like 50%. But I do think that there will be a drop, but the problem with this drop is people are mortgaged to the hilt. And I would just, you know, really manage your affairs and not panic. But I have, I just hope that there's not people panic selling. And once that starts, oh my God, is it ever hard to it's like, And it. it's like a fire too. It kind of yeah. spreads. Yes, um, yes. So I hope that doesn't happen because if you have immigration, it kind of covers it a little bit. Yeah. But if you're in a country that's not getting a lot of immigration inflows, it's, it's going to be a challenge. 
Okay, I do want to kind of steer the conversation to something a little more, you know, upbeat uh, yes. to, to kind of wrap things up and also mindful of the audience and those pearls of wisdom that I promised. Um, what is kind of the best piece of advice that you would have for, for people who are watching and, and listening today as they embark on their entrepreneurial journey or uh, embark in, you know, supporting someone on that entrepreneurial journey, which, which takes cojones and it's certainly in the, in the start and sometimes it's not so easy. Yeah, I mean, all I would say is ignore a lot of the noise. There's going to be so much noise, but knowing full well that a lot of the companies that that were around that that didn't focus in on positive unit economics and it was just a good story, they will be gone. And for the entrepreneurs here, uh, and and you know, I've spent a lot of time uh, both uh, you know in my current time in my previous careers in Latin America. And they tend to be far more pragmatic in that uh, when I look, I, I can tell without you showing me a pitch from the United States versus a pitch from Latin America, I can tell. Because the, the US pitch, Canadian one too, but a US pitch, I'm trying to figure out, okay, uh, let me take down their optimism because they get a little bit crazy. Uh, the Latin America try to take it up and say, okay, yeah, you're giving me the realistic one, but you know, how good this, could this possibly be? One of the challenges in Latin America has been the supply of capital. And, and th there has been a lot more capital uh, going there. And I, I would say, uh, and this is what I'm telling, you know, entrepreneurs that I've invested in, you really got to focus in, always need to focus in on your positive unit economics all the time. And it doesn't mean you have to be uh, profitable. That's not what I'm saying. It's just, just that with every sale that you're making, you better not be losing money with every sale. And if you are, just stop your business. But also grow sustainably. I would rather invest in the company that can grow at 30-ish percent, 40 percent, but they can grow their organization and be very predictable, but grow for the long term as opposed to this growth at all cost mentality. I always thought it was ridiculous. If you ever want to read a good book, uh, Jim Collins wrote, uh, after, uh, not good, the great, the one afterwards, uh, second book, I can't remember what it's called. I might have to Google it. Does oh, anyone oh, in the oh. audience know? The second book, Jim Collins, uh, anyways, it, and they had the, the, the story of the two uh, explorers going to the South Pole, and uh, I can't remember who they were, going to Asmundsen, and anyway. Good to great? Good to, uh, uh, no, uh, no, the other one. Was the other one. Aye. Right after Good to Great. Uh. Anyways, there's a two. Built, Built to, last. to Last. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> if you read Built to Last, that was one of the most influential books that I read. It's basically, don't, they, you know, I mean, a company that tries to go to 100% builds the organization up, and it's like, uh-oh. Uh, you know, th there's very, very few of those that actually work. Well, the, the, the parable is the two explorers going to the, the, the South Pole one planned very, very carefully. And, uh, and they'd say, okay, if I had to go 100 miles, I'm going to do 10 miles every day, no matter what. Even if I finish early, we're just going to chill. The other one went 20 miles one day, then 30 miles, and then two miles the next day. Well, they all perished and died. Uh, and and th this is kind of the story here is... Just grow within your means, go with optimism, but there will never be a better time now, and you will have less competitors, you will have more talent, um, you know, and while people are sulking and worrying about licking their wounds, you can keep on progressing. And, you know, if we go into a recession, just readjust your, your expectations, but this is a time, again, when you can get stronger than you ever have and take advantage of that. And just like 
I don't know whoever said, you know, never waste a crisis. Uh, don't waste this crisis. Okay. That feels like a great place to leave it. I, I could go on and on and on, okay. but I, I think that's kind of the right mark to hit. Thank you so much for your time and your insight. And to this lovely audience, I cannot say how wonderful it is to kind of feel the energy of in-person events again. It's, um, it's miraculous. Love it. Great. Thank you Thanks, all. Thanks, guys. Thank you.